Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day -day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners, loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this show and just tell me what they do and let me record how this decade affects us. Please do donate any amount you can to the Working Hours Project through PayPal or consider sustaining Working Hours with a regular £1 a month or more subscription on Patreon.com. Addresses for support are in the outro. This is intended as an expansive and expensive long-term project which I want to make available to anyone and I can only do that with your help. So if you can, please help. What did you want to be when you grew up? So it, it's quite interesting because I went through so many different phases when I was growing up that I didn't really have any single thing that I wanted to be. And actually, even when I try and remember what I wanted to be, I can't think of any. So I think I, I just went through life under the assumption that I'd figure it out eventually. Mm. And I, I don't think it was even until about college that I started to properly get an idea. And the funny thing is, it, I wanted to actually be a philanthropist, mm. uh, but then you need a lot of money to do that. Yeah, know? I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was like the first sort of firm time thing that I wanted to be. And then when I got really into music, I went through a big protest singer phase mm. and I, I loved sort of Bob Dylan and Joan Baez. And obviously I was convinced that I was going to be the next Joan Baez, but obviously uh, I, that didn't work out. So yeah, I went, there's, there's quite a few different things that I wanted to do, um, which are quite different to what I do now. You're listening to Series 4, Episode 6, and to my guest, Catherine War. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 8th of February, 2023. Catherine War is a filmmaker and historian born and raised in Leeds. Catherine's work is mostly centred on Yorkshire history, but also anything else she finds interesting. Catherine is also the Digital Content Coordinator for the British Association for Local History, helping to engage with local historians through digital media. Catherine is passionate about making history interesting, engaging and accessible for all. She has also written a book about Yorkshire folklore, customs and traditions, which is due to be published this year. If you'd like to see Catherine's work, go to youtube.com at Catherine War. That's W-A-R-R. -R. Follow, listen, share, guest, donate to podcasts you like. And if you don't like this one, what are you doing here? Turn it off. Loiners, get your ass on this show and then get your friends and neighbours on it too. Please join me on Patreon or Ko-fi to provide monthly support or help the show with a donation. Demonstrate your support for this show on social with likes, follows and shares. If you want to keep listening to interviews such as these, then you will need to do something to help facilitate that. Because I'm all spent up now. Share and recommend Working Hours wherever and whenever you can. Right, let's do this. Episode 86 of Working Hours with Catherine War. So let's just dive straight into it then. So what is it that you do do now? So I'm a filmmaker and a historian. I do lots of little things under that umbrella. So I run a YouTube channel, which is mostly about Yorkshire history, but I've also rebranded so that I can do basically anything I find interesting. Mm. And I've written a book, which I'll talk about a bit later. And I'm also the digital content coordinator for the British Association for Local History. How did you get into that then? Was it just a matter of starting a YouTube channel where you were, at, where you were studying or...? Did it, was it something you did after you finished study? Like, how did it come about? I started my channel in 2018 uh, in my second year of uni, and it was genuinely just something to do in my spare time. And it sort of, it trundled along, not doing very much for a few years. And then in 2021, I'd tried working full time, 
in a normal job. And I just, I just couldn't take it. It wasn't for me. And part of it I've realized is, is my autism in that I, I can't do with an eight hour work day where you've got to go into an office that I'm far more project based. Hmm. And I didn't like the feeling that my life was slipping away from me that, you know, you'd go home in the evening and have about four hours left in your day. Hmm. And it, it, I had a whole existential crisis. So in 2021, I decided to take a gap year to figure out what to do. And then I thought, well, I can focus on my history channel. And fortunately, it all started to come through. Then I was able to sort of pursue it properly and do what I do now. And so did the writing, like writing the book, did that come about as a sort of natural extension of just, you know, you're already creating scripts and so on for, for your YouTube channel. So was that just, you know, writing a longer script? Yeah, absolutely. And I got the idea for the book quite by accident because I was, I was literally just on a bus one morning and I was thinking about this particular book called The English Year by Steve Rood, which is about uh, English folklore and customs and traditions. Mm -hmm. And I'd done a few videos on Yorkshire folklore and, and stuff like that. And I thought, well, that's a good book, but it doesn't actually cover a whole year. It just covers things like Christmas and Easter. Mm. What if someone wrote a book which did cover a whole year? Mm. Well, I could do that. <laughs> so I, I, I went home with this idea of writing a Yorkshire year, which I ended up doing. And it's, it, it's a full year, 366 days. And so, yeah, it, it's just an extension, really, of what I was, was doing. I mean, I assume you were studying history and that's why you sort of picked a history channel or was that just a, a side interest on top of your studies? Yeah, so um, actually, no, I didn't do history. I did peace studies at mm. Bradford Uni. Cool. Um, and I enjoyed it, and it's fun because my surname is Wall. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, and the reason I, I chose Yorkshire History when I started the channel is because I, I've always been really into history as a kid. It was something that was a big part of my childhood. And I just noticed one day that there wasn't really anyone doing Yorkshire history. There, there's a lot of people doing British history or world history or military history. Mm. And I thought, well, that's, that's a niche I could sort of capture, which mm. I did. <laughs> and how far back have you sort of taken it? Are you like, where, where are you working in a specific sort of time frame, or are you just looking across the whole? Thing? Like, yeah, how are you? So, for example, with mine, I'm focusing the podcast on leads. I've got a limit to how many people. Like, what are the kind of boundaries you put on yourself? Have you kind of limited yourself in any way? When I started, it was just Yorkshire history. Which is which is fine, but then I began to feel a little bit constrained because I was limiting my topic in a way. Mm. Uh, but even then, I was covering chronologically everything from sort of the ancient Romans up to modern day. And also, what I, I began to feel uncomfortable because people began to have these expectations from me because I was doing Yorkshire history and they really wanted me to be the type of person who goes... A up white rose, God's own country, which is not, it's totally not me. Like it, okay. that is not me and it's, it's utter cringe. And I began to feel really constrained. So I sort of, I, I rebranded so that now I can, I can do basically anything I find interesting. And it does usually link back to Yorkshire. The last video I did was on actually the Vietnam war, which is like very not Yorkshire, mm. but it was something I, I found really interesting. Mm. But the one I'm working on at the minute is about the forgotten British baseball boom, which does have a lot of connections with Yorkshire. Mm. So, you know, different topics and, and things like that. So when was that? When was the baseball boom? Was that sort of post-Second World War? Oh, it's, it's a fascinating. You're going to have to watch the video. But in, in short, basically, uh, Brit British people have been playing baseball in, since the Victorian times, actually. Mm. And then in the in 1930s, it was sort of like the... The climax, because in the 1938 Amateur World Series between Britain and America, Britain actually beat America. A brilliant story. And mm. it was a, a five-match series at mm. Liverpool, Leeds, Hull, Halifax, and Rochdale. So all northern locations, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, fascinating. It's like, <laughs> this, this is the amazing thing. You know, you get certain historical narratives that you sort of present it with over and over again. And then there's just, there's so much, well, hidden history for want of a better term, 
um, or less popular history. And there's always like, yeah, there's always stuff to discover. Cool. I mean, like I would I literally have no idea that that happened or would have happened, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And the funny thing is my channel name did used to be Yorkshire's Hidden History. Yes. <laughs> so, um, let's let's start off with some of the questions and and try and pull out a bit more from from them so we'll start off with lockdown so normally i ask people to kind of think about where they were at the time that they were locking down um and just look at sort of early part of the lockdown like what your work was like if you were working how much you were working were you working more or less and then look at the sort of changes for you that have come out of that period. Lockdown started when I was in my last year of uni. Um, so in March, it was actually when I was moving out of uni anyway. Mm. So it didn't really affect me too much because I was just writing my dissertation and I could do it from home. But I do remember feeling this, this sense of grief at the fact that I wouldn't have a a graduation or things like that. But the mm. funny thing is actually is that I'm I'm really not bothered anymore. I got my degree posted to me and then they they actually hosted the graduation last year, but I just mm. wasn't bothered. So in in that period, like my channel, it was still something just in my spare time. I didn't really have any bold ambitions for it. And that was the time when I was gearing up to enter the quote unquote real world of work. So I was focused on getting like a proper job. And so throughout that period of lockdown in that summer of 2020 is a really interesting period and I reflect because it actually showed me the limitations of trying to balance something creative with a full-time job because mm. you'd be working full-time and then when you came home, you'd have to prioritize what you wanted to do. So you can either watch a TV show, play some games or tidy your room, but you can't do all of that and a bit of research for a video. Mm. And in fact, the only time I had free was a weekend. So I would literally on, on a single day, research, write, film and edit a video, which is why from that period, you know, they're not very good. And then obviously if I, I couldn't go out on a weekend or see people or things like that, because that was the only time I had to spare. Mm. So, but, so it was, it was really useful in actually showing that if you are a creative person and this, this is, this explains one of the inequalities in the industry, actually, because it's very difficult to balance your creative side with working full time. And if you need to work full time to support yourself or your family, that puts you at a massive disadvantage because you no longer have that time to actually pursue it. Mm -hmm. It's why vast majority of people who are uh, famous musicians or actors nowadays tend to be middle and upper class because they had the financial resources to be able to have a few years just mm -hmm. focused on their creatives in London and stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I think I rambled there, but I hope that's answered the No, point. no, 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 that's, that's on point. Um, so let's, let's go into some of the detail of, of kind of the making and, and sort of how that developed, because I mean, that's, it's kind of stemmed from lockdown by the sounds of it. Is that fair? Um, I would say it's stemmed. I mean, because I was, I was doing it since 2018. Mm. Um, and and like I mentioned, with not having the time when I was working, it was actually during lockdown, I had less time to make videos. Mm. But it was, it was towards the end of 2020 that I, I stopped and I began to refocus on my history stuff. Mm. How do you go about the making? And like when you started off, so, so for example, your first video, was it just you to your phone? Or did you, did you, are you one of those people where, no, I need to get all the equipment. I need all my stationary or all my equipment first before I can do anything and then I start yeah so my my very first video uh, it was actually on the battle of Leeds in the civil war and it was just me and iPhone 4 mm. uh, wandering around Leeds doing selfie mode uh, I mean it's not very good obviously because it's four years old and it's nowhere near to my quality now but mm. there, there you know there's something in there and people you know found value in it and and so, yeah, so for most of my time doing videos, actually, it was extremely basic. It was literally like an iPhone or a, another phone, um, but free basic editing software, you know, not really planning stuff out, operating entirely on vibes of, oh, mm. I'll, I'll make a video today. And so now that 
I've got the time and, and more resources, I've been able to get better equipment. Um, I actually sort of, I, I work with someone, not on a, like a professional relationship, but just, you know, we, we're good friends and then we enjoy working together. Mm. So that's like doubling the, um, the creative output. Uh, but, but the, it, it's reassuring, I think, or it should be because I was able to get this audience whilst Bill, whilst being very basic and very rough and ready, that it's not necessarily having a £4,000 camera, which makes a difference, is actually having a bit of charisma, having passion and knowledge, mm. because that'll, that'll sleep through any of the technical problems. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you think of anyone you watch on TV who's a history person and, the, you know, why, why you would go back to them is like they seem knowledgeable, they seem like they've got some charisma and passion, you know, that's what draws people people in so and there's an obsession with kind of quality but that's always kind of not been a thing like I remember you know you look at VHS tapes and stuff and the, like the appalling quality of TVs in the 20th century and things like that like we'll watch anything of any awful <laughs> quality if, there, if there's something in it worth watching did the lockdown give you any kind of so now do you work to, to like a routine or is it sort of a bit of free form and, and, you know, some routine, like, are you quite, do you have the flexibility in your working now that you sort of were after or? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I actually have the best of both worlds because so now I plan everything out. I've got lists upon lists upon lists of like all my different projects. I've got sort of the the months in the year sketched out with what kind of videos I want to do. And so when it comes to doing a project, now I can just sit down and like write out a list of what I need, mm. you know, how, how I'll plan it. And this gives me the routine of sort of knowing exactly what I'm doing and, and having kind of the same process for each video, but also the flexibility of, oh, I want to do this for this video. Mm. And then... I'll, I'll research it, I'll, and then I'll write it, and then I'll send it to my friend and then get some feedback, and then we'll, you know, and because we're both sort of quite flexible as well, we can basically film it any time. Mm. And then if I'm, if I'm feeling that hyper-focus, I can just, you know, work for four hours straight. Other times, you know, it's difficult to concentrate. So it, it, the way I work now is, is way more flexible and it's way more adaptive to mm. the particular needs of each project. Mm -hmm. And have you got, like, have you got workspace? Do you have a home studio or office? Like, how do you separate that sort of work, work and life? Or do you, do you make that distinction? Well, it's interesting because I don't have the home office that I would like. Mm. I mean, I just have my, my computer room, but it, you know, it, it gets a, it gets a job done. And I, mm. I have little rituals for creating a little work-life balance mm -hmm. so what I do now although I was lazy today and I've broken my rule is on, on a work day I'll, I'll put on a shirt and some mm. proper trousers as though I was going into the office yeah. and even though it, it might sound slightly ridiculous because I'll only work about three or four hours in the morning mm. and then I'll take my work clothes off at lunchtime and put some normal clothes on yeah mentally it, it gets you into the headspace of okay this is work time yeah, And I think that's so tremendously useful because if you're in your pajamas every day, as tempting as it may be, it doesn't give you that separation. No. Yeah. And it, yeah, it doesn't incline you too much. <laughs> I've been there and done that plenty of time. <laughs> um, so let's, let's kind of look at, so what, do you think there are any changes that came out of COVID for you? Any kind of like, realizations i mean for a lot of people it was the sort of just the revelation of working from home um but i mean you will have been doing that already so is there anything that you think did change i mean was that that work separation and the work-life balance is that something that you kind of developed through lockdown or was that something you were already working on so my, my work-life balancing is actually, I've only implemented fairly recently. And I, I, I've mentioned this before in terms of, because I was working actually in an office, like, like a normal job during COVID. And that's how I realized that I couldn't do that. Mm. And then 
that's when I started focusing more on my history stuff on the tail end of 2020. But it's, it's also interesting because there was a, a slight boost in, in viewing numbers because obviously everyone was at home. Mm. So, you know, it, 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 it was obviously, you know, it was a very bad time, but in, there were good things that came out of it. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was just interesting as well, seeing how it felt like everyone started a podcast or started a new hobby and stuff. Mm. Um, and I was here like, look, I, I've been here for years, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that's good as well because you, you know, you've already got that audience. You know, you've already got an, an audience there. So hopefully that. I mean, did you see a big increase? Did that help a lot having all everyone at home? Yeah, I mean, I'll have to check my stats because it's it's difficult to separate it from whether you know whether videos I made that year particularly good, and that's why I got more views. Or, mm. but I think absolutely it had an effect of people now being online basically all day every day. Mm. Is there anything else we want to say about COVID before we move on? I mean, I think the the, the last thing I'll say is it's interesting because COVID didn't really negatively impact my channel. I mean, like I said, it it helped it really and. That's because in sort of the the new world of digital content, it seems like the way you work and the content itself is very separated from the real world. Mm. And that basically the only way it gets affected is if all the world's internet servers go down. Mm. In that, you know, unless like there's some great disaster where you live, it doesn't really matter what sort of is happening in your country you still have the power to connect to the internet and make this content. And that's, that's quite um, liberating and empowering, really, and democratizing. Mm, mm. Yeah, and I like that you've, you've mentioned that. I, I mean, sort of early days of the internet, there was a lot of talk about, you know, the, the democratizing effects of the media and so on. And, um, yeah, you don't hear much about that anymore. It's more <laughs> social media seem more as like, anti-democratic and problematic and so on uh but i do think like you see a lot of content creators on youtube who are really kind of like you know sick of the algorithm and sick of youtube and stuff and are quite derogatory towards it but then at the same time it's kind of marvelous you know that there's this entire massive global tv channel that anyone can kind of contribute to yeah absolutely i mean I totally get the frustration uh, because my most watched video is this terrible one I made four years ago when I went to Kirk's Abbey in Leeds. Mm. And like, it's, like it is it's so bad, but for some reason, the algorithm picked it up and it's my most watched video. So, you know, sod's law, obviously, you know, that's what people, that's people's first and often only impression of me mm. and that the actual good stuff sort of wallows in obscurity. So, you know, that is very frustrating, but, you know, you do have to be thankful that you have this platform. And a really great thing about what I do is that the stuff I make can reach all over the world. Mm. So I have a lot of viewers in, internationally, like America, Australia, Canada, Europe, who who either just found my channel by accident or they wanted to find, in some cases, where their ancestors came from, if they migrated from Yorkshire or mm. just different things. and. And that is something that you could never have achieved 20 years ago. Mm. You know, in my, in my experience working in sort of the local history world, probably, you know, most groups are on the level of producing a little booklet for, you know, of 30 copies sold at the village hall. And that, yeah. that never goes anywhere after that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think, well, we'll, we'll get into it later, but uh, I'll, I'll mention it now, but I think it's so important like through the climate crisis of like, you know, because there's this sort of, you have to go around the world to discover, you know, it's quite a colonial mindset in a lot of ways of like, you know, the only discovery I can make is if I fly to somewhere exotic or to somewhere remote or, you know, but really there's so much to discover, like literally on your doorstep, under your feet. So I think that's it's a, it's a really good thing. I think local history will become bigger and more important over time. I mean, are you seeing? Do you think continuous growth on the channel, which I assume you're seeing, do you think that's driven by more interest in local history or just natural growth from YouTube? 
I mean, it's interesting because I think a lot of I've had a lot of comments from people who they'll live in the area of something I'm talking about and they'll go, Wow, I, I had no idea this was this was happening. Mm. And so there is this real hunger for for localized knowledge where you might often only get it if you intentionally go out of your way to find it. But mm. you know, if you're just browsing YouTube and you come across it, you know, it's it, it's ready made. And I think that, you know, that definitely is going on. And also, you know, I, I don't think people are being turned off terrestrial TV. But I think people are now turning more actually to to YouTube because mm. I remember reading something recently that on smart TVs, YouTube has taken over traditional streaming services like Amazon Prime or Netflix. I know that sounds really old. That's going to make you feel old. Traditional streaming services, <laughs> but you, you know what I mean. And it's and so it's it is actually like this this consumer driven thing that they get on YouTube things that they can't get elsewhere. Mm. And especially in British factual TV, where you've got Michael Portillo's 500th train journey mm. or Lucy Worsley's 400th, you know, documentary, you, it, the production companies have to pitch something to companies. Mm. And obviously they'll go for something which is the easiest, laziest choice because yeah. risks often don't pay off well. And channels will just commission the same thing over and over. And people, people are getting tired of that. And what people, and I don't mean to boast when I say this, but this is just what I've read in comments. From me, people get this really refreshing view of history. They get things which they don't see on their TV channels, mm. which, is, which is like, it's fun. It's got a young person. Wow. And it's got, got someone who isn't, you know, from a Russell Group University or a doctor, mm. you know, with an RP accent. It's, in a way, it's fulfilling this, this demand in the market. Yeah, 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 and the, and they're they're very form formulaic. Like, I mean, if we think of generally, if we're thinking of history programs in the UK, you you're thinking BBC really because they're the ones that kind of consistently produce them. Um, and it is very much like you know an academic either one we we've just found which we think will be good for TV or someone that's got some name recognition, and they follow a very kind of set formula of how they're made and how they're done. Um, and it's also like the, the information presented, and it does depend on who's making the documentary, so this isn't everyone, mm. but on some of them it's so basic that it's almost insulting the in audience's intelligence. I mean, mm. I watched one where it said the Blitz was when, you know, Germany bombed Britain. Like, wow, we learned that in primary school, but that is a level of information being given. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And um, yeah, always the same stories, you know, like because that's what people buy as well. But it's uh, like, you know, how many histories of Churchill or the Second World War or, you know, like set kind of Victorian eras. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of history. <laughs> so, mm. Like, why see the same things over and over? I mean, do you just talking about the actual work i mean the the joy of the work i assume is the discovery process the research and stuff and then the sort of seeing it come together like from the filmmaking side what are the um obviously if i've got that wrong mm. correct me but like from the filmmaking side what are the things that you kind of really enjoy i mean does it all come together for you in the edit or is it all about the writing or like what's the your favorite bit well i, I could talk for ages on this so so please the, do uh, yeah <laughs> so Let's start with the research. So the interesting thing is that I don't actually do a lot of original research. I don't go to archives. Mm. Uh, part of that is an accessibility issue, but also I view myself as, as repackaging what's already been researched, mm. but into a different format. And mm. so, you know, I'll just go to the library and I'll, I'll get out a load of books. Although interestingly, what I do is that I, I found that a lot of antiquarian books, which are out of print, and may only have been published in the 1850s. They've got a lot of information which haven't been put on the internet yet. So you can mm. find a lot of facts which have been locked away. Mm. And in the process of, of research, you might start out with a particular angle, but then you'll find that it, it, you find new things out and then the mm. whole course of the video changes. And I found that very, very strongly in one I made on William Bradford, who was a governor of Plymouth Colony, which was the, the pilgrim colony in New England from the Mayflower in 1620. Mm. And he was born in Osterfield, which is near Doncaster. 
Mm. And he's a really interesting figure because, you know, he is this 17th century Puritan, but he had this tremendously difficult upbringing. A lot of his family died in his childhood. So he's witnessed all of this death. And then he leaves mm. everything to go into this, this, this strange unknown land mm. and, and to found a new colony. And even in, in the way he acts, he is he's surprisingly forward thinking because in the interactions with the Native American tribes in the area, he is surprisingly, I don't know if peaceful is the right word, but he doesn't go in saying, okay, let's slaughter all of them. He understands mm. that you actually need to work together. Mm. And so he's, he's, he's widely hailed as, you know, one of the most important figures in early colonial America. Mm. And then I was, and then I'd written the script and I'd filmed it all and I was just putting it together. And I was just finishing off reading this book, which I didn't finish during research. Mm. And then I found that he'd actually written this account of this massacre of Native Americans. Mm. And I was like, okay, well, this changes everything. This is like changed the whole thesis then. Because I couldn't, I couldn't ignore it because it was obviously there and I, I would feel guilty to mm. pretend that it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I just had to film this bit going, um, hi everyone. So after I've made this video, I just discovered this bit where he talks about the slaughter of hundreds of people. So, mm. you know, um, and, then, and then that changed the video into what was a fairly straightforward factual documentary into this, this journey of the process of how we actually understand history and how we evaluate complicated figures mm. and you know maybe the um the limitations of play of placing too much expectation on them so mm. that's just one example and that was a bit of a ramble mm. but what i also like is and this has come through more recently is just the absolute freedom it gives you mm. so the the last one that i i published was on the vietnam war mm. and Obviously, you need a big 60s soundtrack, but obviously all the songs are copyrighted. So what do you do? Well, you make your own. You record your own songs. <laughs> so I did, I did these covers of these like iconic 60s guitar riffs, mm. you know, put that in a soundtrack. And then with my producer, who's like the friend I work with, you know, I call him producer because it sounds very professional. <laughs> we, we sort of enable each other's absolute worst. Because I was like, well, I want, I want to build a set. You know, I want it to look 1960s. Mm. So then bit by bit, we just add something even more insane. And so mm. we got all of these props. I mean, it, we built an entire set. And then it was like, well, there needs to be a second character. So now there's, there's two different Catherines in the video. So, and I love that the format on the platform gives you the freedom to do that. Mm. And then you can absolutely go wild. And, you know, it's... It, yeah, so that, that, those are mainly what I love. And then in the actual process of publishing it, I do like seeing the genuine affection people have for them and the experience of learning something new because a lot of them just genuinely really enjoy it and it is immensely gratifying to see them mm. enjoying it. Mm. Have you, like, do you push your film? I, I mean, it sounds like you do. Do you push your filmmaking side quite a bit? Are you always kind of like reaching to sort of Oh, how can I do this? Oh, can I add this in? Oh, I'd, like, because I imagine it's just constant learning, you know, things that you pick up from just mm. repetition and by accident, but then other things that you're kind of like, I want to add that in. How do I do it? Uh, and yeah, absolutely. So how um, do you learn? How do you, are you like watching YouTube videos or are you just kind of teaching yourself through trial and error? Well, I, I, I've always been very self-taught. I was never, you know, taught media at school or uni. It's always entirely been trial and error. And there is a sort of debrief after each video uh, where because, you know, I have to watch it a hundred times anyway during editing that you notice what bits worked and what didn't and what things be you'll do better next time. Mm. And the very first video I sort of I made with with my producer was seven months ago, and it was about this hill fort in Huddersfield, and it's still a good video. You know, I'm, I'm still very fond of it. But if you look at the dramatic difference from just seven months ago to now, mm. it's like this meteoric pace of learning, mm. and it's it's not that we're particularly talented. It's just that you have to have this very intentional process mm. of improving every single time. And saying, okay, well, in this one, I'm going to do something technical that's new. I'm going to yeah. try and discover something new on the camera. Yeah. So I've just been filming recently, actually, 
uh, for the baseball one. And we, we filmed this whole opening sequence at Roundy Park because that's like my thing now. I have sort of a minute long montage to sort of set the vibe for the video. Yeah. And uh, the camera does slow motion. I was like, oh, brilliant. So that's something new we've done this time. Mm. And then for the next one we'll do, we'll have to, have to challenge ourselves and thinking, okay, well, what are we going to do this time now? And if I, if I um, could digress a little bit, it's for anyone who's creative, you absolutely need the mindset. And a brilliant example I read uh, in a book recently was about golf. So professional golfers, they have to very rapidly switch between two completely different modes of thought. So when they're taking the shot, they need to have total confidence that this is going to be the shot. This is going to be the perfect shot. And then as soon as they finished, they need to be very analytical and think, okay, what do I need to do now? They can't think about the shot they've just done or the next mm. one. Mm. They've got to think, how do I make this one the best? And then they're doing that rapidly every single time. And, you know, it's not some sort of secret for success, but when I think of when I used to do everything entirely by myself, often mm. I just, I just be impatient and I'd put out something that wasn't good because I couldn't be bothered to wait another day when it was lighter, if that, you know. And yeah. so it's having that intentionality of going, okay, this is going to absolutely bang. This is brilliant. This is the best I've ever made. You know, three days later, okay, well, you know, I wouldn't do that now. What do I need to do? Let's go on to social media. So obviously YouTube is a social media, although it's often not thought of that way. It's the world's second biggest search engine. So, I mean, you literally work on social media. So my question is generally about like the change in work, the impact of social media on work, how much time you have to spend on social media, generally for promotion, uh, but other aspects of work as well. Like, do you find that it's worth the time that you have to put into it? Like, do you see a direct kind of uh, return on investment for that time? Or is it just kind of throw it at the thing and hopefully the algorithm does the thing and I don't know what I've done, but I, if I keep posting something, then that seems to help, which is my approach. How is it for you? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same. There's, there's a lot of hustle involved. And, you know, it's got, it's got a massive effect because like, um, if, some, if something gets posted somewhere, it can dramatically change the fortunes of a video. So the, the second most watched video is on the start of rugby league in 1895. Mm. And that got shared on Australian social media because rugby league's massive in, in parts of Australia. So that got a massive boost. And very recently, I think there was like a BBC radio series on ghosts. And they must have mentioned the, the Roman ghost. Mm. The, the Roman soldiers, which is quite famous, which I'd done a video on um, about a year before. And then it, I never found out where it was posted, but just randomly, I got this, this massive burst of views for it. Mm. So it's absolutely something where if the right person with the right view, view um, like subscribers or followers amplifies it, it can you know, massively make it reach a new audience. Mm. And even, even yourself, kind of the way that you have to advertise and share your stuff, you have to have a whole social media strategy, you know, you like, but yeah, I think once, once you get a hold of it, once you understand what you're doing, mm. it's, it's quite easy actually. And it's, it's quite easy to build up, especially for me, an international audience. Mm. So on Twitter, for example, I've got quite a few followers who are American. And I'm not sure how or why they follow me, but now they do. Mm. And obviously with this baseball one, well, that is what I can market directly to them. Mm. Social media isn't the be all and end all because I, I do a fair amount of hustling in, in the real world as well. Mm. But it's sort of the thing where you, if, you, if you play your cards right, it can be very beneficial. Mm. But also you can't rely on the algorithms because they're ultimately arbitrary and capricious. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's what I think triggers a lot of the mental health uh, problems with content creators. Uh, to, so to give an example, I made a video a few months ago on the Loftus Princess, who's this Anglo-Saxon uh, princess discovered on the, on the Yorkshire coast. Mm. And I think maybe because it had the keyword Anglo-Saxon in there, mm. within like a, hours of uploading, it sort of, it got promoted in the algorithm and it got about 5,000 views. And I've mm. never had that before. 
mm. or, on one other video, but it's extraordinarily rare for me. And I was like, mm. oh my gosh, it's happening. Mm. But then that wears off. And then that doesn't happen for six months. And okay. you're thinking, oh, come on, maybe this time it'll happen again. So, yeah, it's, you know, it can be very beneficial, but also the algorithm is never your friend. You shouldn't operate under the assumption that it's got your best interest in mind, if it makes sense. What it cares about is getting clicks mm. and it'll try to get the most clicks. And if it does, if it promotes you, but then it finds it doesn't get clicks, it'll go, I don't want to play with you anymore, you know? <laughs> Mm, I mean, uh, the nearest thing I can compare it to, like looking at analytics and so on, is is kind of like sales, you know, like a sales role. You, it's about numbers and it's like bringing as many people as possible and so on. But when you make the sales, you you want to claim the credit for it. It's like, I've done it, I've made the sale. And to a degree you have, and various salespeople are different and better. But, you know, at the end, it's still arbitrary. It's like whether that customer buys or not, which is the same with the numbers of like, you know, sometimes it'll do really well and you hope you can build on, them, but other times it's just not going to. I mean, how do you, are you quite good at sort of not looking at the analytics too much or does that sort of give you that emotional roller coaster of like, oh, it's doing really well. Ooh, why is no one looking? Like, how's yeah, oh, I'm, I'm the absolute worst. Like I'll, <laughs> I, I check my analytics all the time. I've even got a whiteboard up in my computer room where yeah. every Monday, I update all the numbers, you know, to my, to my particular goals. And to be honest, it is useful in seeing what videos are trending mm. because a lot of it is, is inexplicable. So mm. about two years ago, I made a video on Amy Johnson from Hull, who was the first woman to fly solo from England to Australia. Mm. And, you know, that did all right. And then all of a sudden in the past month or so, it's been the most viewed of my, um, videos for this month if that makes sense yeah so for some reason it's being promoted in the alg algorithm more it's, mm. it's not her anniversary recently i mean mm. it was i think you know a few weeks ago but for some reason it's decided to show people that one mm. um but th there are some ones which you can make a connection so years ago i did a, a kunk on yorkshire parody mm. and you know it's, it's quite good uh, although obviously I'd do it way better now. And obviously the new Philomena Kunk Netflix show has mm. given that a bit of a boost. Yeah. But yeah, it can be useful. It can help show you what ones are being watched, what ones aren't. But generally the, the great, the best advice I've ever heard actually is about stock trading because stocks, they go up and down every single day. And it says mm. the happiest person checks their stocks every month. Mm. Sort of the all right person checks it every week. The unhappiest person checks it every day. Yeah. Because every single day, you're not giving yourself enough time to see the differences and the changes. Yeah. You know, you need to actually give yourself enough time so that you can see the visible difference. Yeah. Like, so, for example, for me, I did. So when I went on Chapel FM last year, there was a huge boost in the sort of download and then you kind of have that boost and then it drops and then uh but then if i look back sort of over last year for example at the, the last episode i kind of postponed for over a week but i'd already done more downloads this month without putting an episode out than i did in the whole of last february so mm -hmm. you know you've got that growth over time but if I looked at it day by day, I would give myself the impression of, oh, they've fallen down and like, how do I get back up to there? And so, yeah, that, I think that's very wise. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, let's go on to, let's do Brexit. So, because I imagine this will be quite short, but um, let's see. So since we have Brexited, have you noticed any change in your work? Have you had to change anything? about the way that you're working or has it impacted your work in any way? Um, yeah, for the good or, or ill? Uh, I, I don't think it's made any impact, to be honest, because like I said, uh, like digital content, it's something fairly in its own bubble. It's unaffected by the real world. But sort of, because obviously I, I lived through that um, and I was, I was in college actually when it happened and with young people, I found, and this is one of the reasons why I actually feel quite alienated from, 
you know, uh, sort of typical student age people is everyone is just so loud about their political opinions. And it's like, well, if you don't think this and you can die. And now that I've, I've matured a little bit, I, I genuinely just don't care about getting into arguments. I mean, mm. occasionally if I feel strongly enough, but everyone when they're younger has this thing where they obviously are the smartest person to have ever lived. Mm. And I'm obviously right about this. Mm. And living through that in my formative years and seeing actually just how demoralizing it, it is mm. for anyone on, on their personal views sort of made me want to be very apolitical in my videos. Mm. So I may mention things which are sort of, you know, in the current discourse. So like with the William Bradford thing, you know, and his, whether he, because I, I don't know if he was a participant in the massacre or if he just witnessed it. Obviously that ties into very hot button issues now, but I, I don't use it to make a very specific political proclamation. I just laid it out for the audience and then gave mm. my personal reaction to it. So I, I do try to avoid being overly political because partly is it, it is, is that I don't think it's directly relevant to the specific videos I'm doing, but also I don't want to alienate anyone. Mm. I actually find it quite off putting when there's someone whose work I enjoy, but then they think something completely the opposite to me, but mm. then they, they post their views with such sort of an obnoxious if you don't agree with me, then we can't get on stuff, you know, mm. approach, mm. which makes sense for things like, you know, basic human rights. But if it's, if it's anything, I just think it does more to separate people than, you know. So generally it's sort of it, Brexit and the whole sort of political atmosphere around that time has informed the way I, I go about making content. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's the the element of you know you always have to tell a story from a particular perspective but you know you can and you know there's there's numerous problems with objectivity but you can be in a a, a sort of mainstream space where you're not necessarily kind of endorsing or you know you're not you can operate in a space where you're quite obviously trying not to do polemic or you know to incite reactions has there been a temptation though with the way that things work? Like, have you ever had that temptation of just like, well, if I just start ranting about something, <laughs> I'm going to get the outrage clicks. Like, has yeah. that, do, do you get that sensation? Because I feel like a lot of it pushes you towards doing that. Absolutely. So um, I, I get annoyed about a lot of historical things and like our perceptions of the past. And the one time I allowed myself to rant, is because every November you get like the really unfunny, woohoo, Guy Fawkes was the last person to enter Parliament with honest intentions jokes. <laughs> and it's like, oh, Guy Fawkes was a hero. Well, actually, you know, when you look at it, okay, you've got someone who is, is willing to murder hundreds of people. And had he succeeded, he would have thrown the British Isles, you know, the United Kingdom and Ireland into arguably the bloodiest sectarian conflict ever known. You know, the aftermath of the, the failed gunpowder plot was that Catholics in Britain and Ireland were seen as all being secret conspirators to bring down the government. Mm. Well, now imagine the fallout if the plot had actually worked. Mm. You know, um, Catholics were emancipated in, in, in British law in the 19th century. I don't think they would ever have been emancipated if they had succeeded in murdering literally the entire political establishment. So no, it's not some edgy v, v for vendetta thing of just because you don't like the current government, Guy Fawkes was right. He was, you know, the, the entire plot was absolutely, you know, barbarous in my view. And it would have, it would have spilled far more blood than it ever would have saved. Mm. And I just made like this minute long rant about it. And obviously, you know, some people got upset with it. They're calling Guy Fawkes a martyr. You look, the whole thing's complicated. No one comes out clean when it comes to 16th century religious politics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. That's the thing. I get, I get a lot of sensory overload, actually, from political discourse. It's actually yeah. why I struggle a bit on social media, because when everyone is talking about the same thing, I find it quite difficult to just, just to move past it. Mm. And so the one time I actually succumbed to, to having a rant was with Guy Fawkes. Um, but there's... 
there's ways that you can do it tactfully and sensitively. And I've learned that it's, it's far less stressful and far more beneficial in the long run. If there's something that you want to sort of get off your chest, if you can phrase it respectfully, so you don't go in going, all right, listen, you're wrong, but you sort of, you, you're a bit gentle. And I think one of the examples of, of that is the Vietnam one, because that was all about personal memories and collective memories. Mm. And how, when we think of the Vietnam, we think, you know, massive protests and draft dodgers. But when you do actually look at the statistics from the time, it was always a minority of people that most Americans did support the war until about the, the early 70s. But we sort of memory hold that. Mm. And I realized with something as sensitive as the Vietnam War, you did have to be, you'd be, be quite, you know, softly, softly catch your monkey. Mm. So I think that's, that's the best way to go about it. You know, if you're doing something which could inspire a lot of heated political debate, you, you have to present it in a way which isn't just going to inflame people. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and it can be quite tricky. I mean, I mean, operating on YouTube, like the thing that I hear again from uh, creators on YouTube is, is sort of with the with the comments on videos. I mean, do you how do you deal with comments? Do you read them? Do you engage with them? Are they generally quite sort of good? Have you got quite a nice community on there, or is it? A cesspit. <laughs> I'd say because I'm not a massive channel, I'm still, you know, fairly small. I've got a, a very tight knit community and, the, the, you know, it is overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. And I do get a lot of regular commentators who enjoy the videos and times when I, I do get difficult comments. If it's engaging with the actual content of the video and they're sort of arguing against it, but as long as they're not being overly sort of arrogant or abusive, I'm I'm happy to sort of engage with them as mm. you know a, a debate. Um, but even when you get just silly ones, you got to think: Is this worth being dragged in? Probably yeah. not, unless you can have like an amazing comeback, which is you know sometimes works. <laughs> but the the annoying thing about YouTube, and especially as I've started making more longer form content, is our need for instant gratification in that unless everything is said immediately in the first 30 seconds, I'm not going to bother watching it. Mm. And I remember last year I made a video on Middleton Railway in Leeds and mm. how the engineers who worked there sort of, you know, they were basically way more important than they are given credit now in popular culture and how George Stevenson actually like stole some of his train designs. And, and the thing is, because one of the, the most important railway engineers was Richard Trevithick, who made one of the early steam engines. And I, five minutes into the video, I literally mentioned Richard Trevithick. But the amount of comments going, oh, well, you didn't mention that Richard Trevithick was actually the inventor of the steam. Well, I, I did, but you didn't watch it. <laughs> I think that's the case. I think with a lot of those comments and, and that, again, from people that watch, it's kind of like, the worst ones is it like you you have you obviously haven't even watched the video like <laughs> you've typed your comment before you've even seen the whole thing okay let's talk about climate change um and how that affects your work so i i approach this now because leeds is declared a climate emergency mm. um so what in your work can you do on the front of kind of raising awareness or mitigation or adaptation around climate change? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I have actually already done this in a way. And it's one of the things where I didn't say it overtly, but it was implied because, you know, back in, in last summer when it was really, really hot, mm -hmm. um, we, um, we went out to Thrust Cross Reservoir and I can't remember exactly where it is now, but basically it's this artificial reservoir and when it was constructed, uh, this abandoned village was sort of destroyed in order to mm. make room for it. Mm. And normally you can't see most of the buildings, but because it was so hot, obviously the water had evaporated and you could see all these ruins. Mm. And you were seeing the same in different rivers across Europe. And so that was sort of implied to the audience that, you, you know, it's great and all that we can see these ruins, but the water's going, you know. Yeah. Um, and that was that was actually interesting in terms of 
illustrating how history is not just some dry fact about something that happened hundreds of years ago, that it's actually in the very, like, earth itself. You know, it's directly affected by external events. I mean, uh, in the Middle East, a lot of, you know, extraordinarily precious items thousands of years old get destroyed because of conflict mm. or national disaster. Mm. And um, there aren't the resources to properly preserve them and transport them to a safe location. Mm -hmm. And so actually the history around us is extremely precarious. And, you know, it can can be destroyed. I mean, in the, in the terrible earthquake in Turkey and Syria, this 2,000-year-old mm. castle has just collapsed. And so in when I made my video on, on Thrush Cross Reservoir, that was sort of one way in my very local, small-scale approach that I can highlight this, this thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, like, I view this as a kind of future history project. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, it's a living, dynamic thing. It's and but it can be kind of presented as so dry. But I think it's another one of those things where the, there is really a massive appetite for it. I think most people find it really fascinating. Just just the story, like you say, you know, the things that are on your doorstep, even blue plaques and stuff. You know, like most, I think mm. a lot of people. I I will always, or most of the time, if I see a blue plaque, I'm going to stop and be like. Oh, what's that say? And who who was here and who are they? And sometimes you know them and sometimes you don't. But if you don't know them, sometimes that's a, a trigger to go and find out more. But um yeah, like how do you go about your ideas? Do you, does it sort of go from one thing to the other? Do you jump about in chronology all over the place? Does it just kind of what interests you at the time or Yeah, you know, do, so do do? my my topics tend to be very, very uh, scrambled and 90% of the time I just see something and learn about it and like, wow, that's interesting. I could definitely do a video about that. Mm. And a lot of the time I'll, I'll see something and I'll store it in, in my brain like a, like, like a squirrel with an acorn, knowing that at some point I can make a use for that. Yeah. So a recent video I did was on champion Jack Dupree, who was this New Orleans blues musician who lived in Halifax. Mm -hmm. And I discovered him about two years previously, and I knew there was such a good story there, but it, it had to take the time for me to do the video justice. And so because now I, I have more sort of more quality in my filmmaking and more sort of production value, I, I could do that, that story a bit more justice. Genuinely, genuinely, like I'll just stumble across things and be like, oh yeah, I can, I can make a good video on this. Or mm. I'll see what's already been made and I think, well, I could, I could do this, but do it at a different angle. Yeah. So I, I did a video on Louis Le Prince or Louis Le Prince. I, or I pronounced it wrong in the video, actually. Oh, no. Um, it was, who, um, who uh, recorded the world's first moving pictures. And one of them was in, as you know, in Rounded Park. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot of stuff on Louis Le Prince. Mm. But I knew all of those videos, they, they couldn't pull off what we managed to pull off because his original camera is actually in the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford. Mm. So we managed to get in there and organized filming and they brought out the camera for us. They literally took the camera out of the cabinet it was on the table. I was looking at it and it was like, yeah, okay, you've made a video which has got 30,000 views, but you're in a studio in California. You you ain't got the actual camera right here. Yeah. So um, <laughs> so that, that was pretty good. And, and um, you know, there's a blue plaque of him by the, the university in Leeds because his workshop was there. Yeah. And I was a, obviously Leeds Bridge is where he filmed another of his, his films. And so he mm -hmm. could you know, go to the same place. So yeah, sometimes there'll be a topic which is very, very popular and it's been done a lot, but I know that I can approach it from a different angle. Mm. So you said there's quite a lot of information on him. So when I first heard of him, I don't think there was that much available as, as if it sort of, you know, in the previous. So I think probably about the time I first heard of him was probably the 100 Years of Cinema. So like 18, 19, 18, 1998. Uh, and 
yeah I don't think there was much known about him at the time mm. so there'd been like a lot of kind of discovery as his profiles kind of risen I don't think there's necessarily been a lot of original discoveries I think what's happened is because what I found in the process of research is that there's there's a few core facts which will get regurgitated across every yeah. single website but then maybe one person with archival access will write a really good book or article. And then that's where you get actually the gold dust, the little nuggets of information. Mm -hmm. So in the video, I mean, like, because he, he is this famous missing person case and a lot of people think he was assassinated by Thomas Edison. And there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with like the patent law at that time. Yeah. And someone had written extensively about Thomas Edison's patent dispute. So I was able to include a lot of that angle. Mm. But generally, it's all about sort of finding the facts which haven't been really that well known. And, and it, again, it's not, it's not like digging in the desert for lost treasure. A lot of the time, it's actually quite easy to find, but it's just not been distributed enough. Mm. Yeah. I see Edison very much as kind of like a musk of his day. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll go into the change question. Yeah. So if you could change any three things about your work, so you can, you've got carte blanche on this. So they can be realistic mm. or unrealistic. You don't have to use all three. If you, if everything is perfect, that's fine. But if you could change any three things about the way that you work sort of right now, what, how, what would you change? So the first one, um, I mean, it's a blessing and a curse the way I started off doing Yorkshire history because because it was like in its own niche, I was able to sort of dominate that niche quite quickly and get quite a strong brand image. Mm -hmm. And so and I was part of a, a YouTube campaign highlighting regional creators. So because I was I was from Yorkshire, you know, I could have be sort of the northern one. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like I like I mentioned before, I did begin to find that quite limiting. And even now, when I I've, I've sort of made it clear through my my more varied content that I'm I'm expanding. I still get people wanting me to be this sort of twee, in last of the summer wine, white rose posting person, which is I'm just not, you know. <laughs> um, and I'd, I'd sort of, what I change is for them to understand that this is what I do now. And I, I feel a little bit like Bob Dylan, actually, because he was doing his folk stuff and everyone was calling him the voice of a generation, but he did feel constrained by that. And then he went electric and everyone rejected him. And it's like, look, I try my best to be just as I am, but everybody wants me to be just like them. Um, so that's, that's what I change. And then the second one is a bit more, a bit more fantastical. Um, I'd, I'd have like million dollar budget. And that, that sounds a lot, but when you get into the world of film making, you realize that doesn't go very far at all. Mm. Um, and then that would just open so many doors in terms of, of production and quality, because right now we're sort of just driving everywhere with two cameras and, and it, it is still very basic. And when I did it all by myself, I would literally just get a train somewhere with a phone and a microphone and, and, and you know, you know, ride by the seat of my pants. And, and that would just allow us to do so many things because we, even now we still are constrained by, by circumstances and outside forces. So where we film a lot of the videos now, you can hear cars going past outside, you know, in my ideal world, we'll insulate it. A lot of it is weather dependent, especially if you're doing outside things. It has to be a sunny day. It has to be low wind. Yeah. Uh, so the audio is fine. Um, whereas when you have a lot of money, you can just get massive lights, even on a bright sunny day, because you want more lights, you know, yeah. and all microphones, which can withstand a, a hurricane and stuff. Mm. And I suppose the last thing I do is I'd, I'd get commissioned by an actual production company or a channel, because the hardest thing I found is making the transition from YouTube to, to actual proper filmmaking. Yeah. And when I started to, to pursue my work a lot, lot more seriously, um, I, I tried to look into how you would actually, you know, get on TV. And there's basically two routes. One is you just happen to be a celebrity who has a famous face like Michael Portillo and therefore can be a presenter. And it was like, okay, well, I haven't reached that yet. And the other way is that you just start off at the bottom and work your way up. Mm. So I joined this, this scheme for people from 
you know, uh, different backgrounds to get into the industry. And that was useless because <laughs> it, it really just reinforced to me how, how difficult and how unfair the industry is. Yeah. And they'd, they'd have advice like, oh, email production companies. Well, I emailed them and they ignored me. Mm. And it really does feel like you're banging your head against a wall, yeah. especially because I am an outsider using this platform, which is, is viewed slightly snob snobbishly. People think that you're not a real historian just because you're on YouTube. And yeah, okay, YouTube, it has some ridiculous people, but it's, it's just a platform. Mm. You know, that's it. Mm. So there is a lot of snobbery from both the historian community and the TV community. But I'm, I'm extremely confident in that I do have something or to offer and that I'm producing stuff which is genuinely original and that, oh, gosh, it, TV to reject me would be like Decca rejecting the Beatles. Can I? <laughs> um, so do you, do you have a final one on the chain? Yeah, I'll oh. sorry. Well, that was the final one. The final one All would right, be then. that I'd get commissioned, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, my instant thought is... Why aren't Yorkshire Tea sponsoring you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Yorkshire Tea, what, what are you doing? Um, and yeah, I, I and the other thing is sort of on the on the kit that you're using. Like I assume your kit's kind of building up over time. But are you like for your production value and stuff? Are you have you got dolly wheels? Are you using like a crane extension? Have you bought a drone or anything? Or is it just... Oh, no. You've Nothing got a like nice that. tripod. <laughs> it's, it's still actually quite basic. So, yeah, so I started off with an iPhone 4 and then I went to just my personal Samsung. And then actually in a quite funny turn of events a few years ago, I got given a phone mm. um, for free. Because I remember someone messaged the, the, the Facebook page of my channel and was like, Oh, I, I work for Samsung and, you know, do you want to have the phone? I was like, all right, okay, that sounds like a scam. Mm. But no, it was genu it was, it was genuinely, this, this guy worked in a, a, a shop in, in Leeds and he really liked my stuff and he wanted to, to support me. So uh, we met up at a public cafe and then he just gave me this phone. I was like, nice. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then when that broke, uh, finally upgraded to a secondhand modern iPhone. I think it's uh, the latest one, but we we bought it second hand. And that is like an amazing quality, but it's still a phone. Mm. The, this, this, is, this is the really thing which a lot of people don't realize. Cameras actually, they're not better than phones. Phone mm. cameras in many ways are better than expensive cameras, mm. you know. Um, so we, we've got, you know, two iPhones now, but we still have to use tripods. Mm. We, we started getting battery powered lights. Mm -hmm. which take ages to set up and only last for 40 minutes mm -hmm. before needing charging. Um, we, we, we invested in a gimbal, which is basically something that lets you hold the camera still. Yeah. But even then, that's, that's it. I still have a clip-on mic, which I've used for years. Yeah. And the, the editing software is, is just Premiere Pro, but I get that through work. So it's, it's not like we've gone leaps and bounds into proper professional stuff. We can, we can do a lot with not a lot. And that's because we spent so long just practicing the skills on my awful iPhone 4 that by the time we got to actual using nice equipment, it just translates with it really well. Yeah. I, and as well, it, it makes you, like being a filmmaker, like with any, any role, it, it's largely problem solving and it makes you more creative because you, mm. you, you have those limitations. Like it's great to have artistic freedoms, but... It's good to have limitations as well. Sometimes. Absolutely. Like that, that's, that's such a good point. Cause what I always say is that being limited actually forces you to be more creative. Mm. If you had 10,000 pounds in equipment, you wouldn't be forced to think outside the box and actually be more creative. Mm. And what, like a major shift in my filmmaking was I did a video on Pablo Fank, who, um, who was this, this black circus owner. Mm. And he inspired the Beatles being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Mm. He's mentioned in the song, Pablo Funk is Fair. Uh, and anyway, he's buried actually in Woodhouse Cemetery in Leeds. So I made a video on him and I went to the cemetery and it was this bitterly cold, awful day. It was wind, um, there was cold and it was cloudy. 
And I was supposed to do all of this stuff to camera, but obviously I couldn't because it was unusable. And I didn't want to come back tomorrow. So I started just getting B-roll and then narrating over it. And then that heralded a shift in how I make films now because I realized I didn't have to be in front of the camera all the time. I could Mm. actually have a nice variety of shots. And Mm. it was that limitation of the weather that which forced me to think differently. Mm. Yeah. If if it had been a bright sunny day, I'd never have done that. Yeah, because you get used to sort of doing things in a set way and then it doesn't necessarily occur to you that you you don't have to do that. It's just like, well, this this is an arbitrary limitation that I've imposed on myself. Like, I can change this. Yeah. <laughs> but that that's like a that's like a, a sort of eureka moment a lot of the time. It's kind of it's one of those, you know, the blindingly obvious hitting you in the face kind of things. Mm. I recognize that basically. So we'll do the UBI question. If you had a UBI, do you think you would have still ended up doing doing this or if it came in now would it would it be helpful so so that's a a universal basic income yeah so a universal basic income would you do what you're doing now if you were still doing would you be doing it as much or would you what would you change about it like how would a ubi change things for you i i think it would utterly change the game because i got my job with the blh in september 2021 uh i can't remember no it's september 2022 that's it no, 21. You probably have to edit this out. <laughs> the point, point is, um, when I got my job with the BALH, that's uh, a part-time uh, paid salary. And that was actually like the first, you know, contracted thing, which, you know, was a regular income stream. Because being a creative, your work is extremely precarious. You don't know what you've got coming. And especially when you're starting out, and I was making next to nothing. Like I didn't even hit the tax bracket and it wasn't enough to live on. So I'm extremely fortunate in getting that job with the BLH mm. because it allowed me to to carry on because it gave me um, regular money. Mm. And then my contract got renewed. And so I had a security um, in my work for another year. Mm. And even though I'm I'm earning more now because I've got different streams, so I do talks, I've got a Patreon, um, I get a little bit of ad revenue. I mean, even that is still not enough yeah. to to match what you would get working part time or full time in a conventional job. But it, it it's it's going up slowly, and I live with my parents, so that cuts out a lot of expenses. Mm. But I know that if I had a UBI, then I would be more secure financially and I'd be able to just have more money for production and not have to set myself a budget um, Mm. because I don't know whether the money I've got in my savings now, how long that will last before my next bit of paid work. Mm. And I think in terms of the creative industries, it will completely change um, the face of it because I mentioned before the reason why the industry is so dominated by the middle and upper classes is because they have the money to be able to live in London for a few years developing their career. Mm. They don't have to work full time because they literally, you know, would not survive otherwise. Mm. If you had this income, which was separate from work, more people would be able to actually get into the creative industries from disadvantaged backgrounds. Mm. And we would have a bigger class diversity in in the, the industry. Mm. Yeah, I fully second that. What was I going to ask you then? I had a question and it's literally just <laughs> left my head. I don't think that's coming back. It'll probably come back to me after we finish recording. <laughs> so at this point, I'm going to just throw it over to you. So first of all, if you want to give us your socials and stuff, but if there's anything else that you want to kind of talk about or or touch on anything that we've missed or overlooked. Yeah, now's, now's yeah. the time. So over to you. Uh, so I'm on Twitter at Hidden Yorkshire. Um, also, you can just Google Catherine War and my different things will come up. Uh, my YouTube is under Catherine War. So again, type that into YouTube, you'll find my videos. My website is Catherine War's History Tours. Mm-hmm. And again, you've got different links to socials. And I've actually got a book coming out, which is, <laughs> there's no way of saying it without sounding, without feeling as though you're being arrogant. Uh, oh, I've, you know, I've written a book, but it's, it's due to be released in around Easter. Mm-hmm. I haven't been told pre- exactly when, 
But as mentioned earlier, it's a Yorkshire year. It's 366 days of folklore, customs and traditions. And there's everything from songs and sports to remedies and recipes and saints and stories and basically any random thing I could find. And if you love stuff like that, you're going to love love this. So I obviously, when I get more information, I'll, I'll post that everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's it. Thank you again to Catherine for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests. And thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. You can follow this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leeds. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. DM me with your questions or most importantly to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Not destroying your brain with social media? Then send me an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com or if you'd like to be anonymous, email me at westernstudios at protonmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to share it with your networks. Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help Working Hours grow. Go to Kofi, that's ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for £3 a month and or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours from as little as a pound a month. There's also an Outlander tier for non-loiners at £5 a month and a £12 a month big time tier for anyone who feels flash. I'm not really offering anything much on the Patreon yet as I'm already doing more than enough unpaid labour on this project. If and when things pick up then we'll see. The goal is to make the podcast and my commitment to it both possible and sustainable. If you are happy to make a regular contribution, but you're priced out by a pound a month, you can go to librapay.com, that's L-I-B-E-R-A-P-A-Y.com forward slash Western Studios forward slash donate and donate from as low as a penny a week all the way up to £89 a week. And people say I'm pessimistic. Again, you can also make one-off donations through LibraPay, which you can do either publicly or anonymously. Remember to like share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours, work for peace and plan with kindness. Okay, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leads on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore leads. And on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios or go to western hyphen studios.com. Okay, so I'll thank you on the recording because this is a nice short one. So thank you very much for doing this and for joining us this morning. And uh, Yes, it's been great. Yeah, it's it's not it's not too awful, is it?